Well, you know where we're going now in the Matthew chapter 10. And I have a, a few things I want to say before I actually read the text today. So if you've gone to page 12 in the Pew Bible, New Testament Pew Bible, or you have your other reading with you, hang on to it. I'll get there. I would say I consider myself a reasonable, faithful Christian. I even make the effort to stand before you each week to share a gospel message. But, but this text, at first read or first glance, I have to admit, is just not, I just do not like this passage. Now, I've heard the arguments that this is but a collection of sayings given by Jesus to the disciples as they set out on a mission of healing and preaching, preaching the good news. I know this is a continuation of the passage we highlighted last week. I know Jesus is preparing disciples and, by extension, us, for the realities of sharing the message. And I know already that life of faith will include some times of struggle and even opposition. Every Christian disciple knows that along the way of faith, some disciples will suffer as Christ suffered, and that the community of faithful must seek to pull together and persevere even in times of fear. But still, as I read through this passage, it just seems like Jesus goes too far. Yet, I feel obligated to address this text I think I'd be intellectually dishonest if I just skipped over it when we did Matthew last week and we'll do Matthew next week. So with those caveats, <clears throat> please listen for God's word to us in Matthew chapter 10, 24 through 39. A disciple is not above the teacher nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If you've called the master to the house of Satan, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. What you have heard whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are count, all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also deny before my Father in heaven. <clears throat> do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring peace. Not, not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father more or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Perhaps you can appreciate how one might struggle with this text. I actually found some of the words and thoughts of William Guckler and others were helpful to me to see this text in a little different light. 
And I want to share some of those thoughts of his and others with you. So let's start with our image of Jesus. I like to visualize Jesus as the one who brings peace, not a sword. Maybe like the picture behind me here, that peaceful looking picture, picture, not a sword wheeling God. I will, I really want to rid myself of an image I got early in my life, actually. To understand that, you need to know that when I was a young kid, I ended up going with my parents almost every month, twice a month, to Saturday night dances at the Swedish Lodge in Moline. And up there in the heatherlands of the peak of that room, was a huge lighted image of Thor. Thor with his hammer and lightning flying. It's been hard work for me to move that image, to make that image fade in my life. That's not the image I want to have of Jesus and my God. But yet it's not easy to change your image you got as a young child. So image of Jesus is important as we consider this text. Second, discord among people is another issue that comes to play here. I spent enough time with various churches to know that discord happens even within the community of the faithful. I also believe Jesus would not intentionally encourage us divisions in the midst of a church family or a biological family for that matter either. But then look at verse 37. Jesus promising to set son against father and daughter against mother. It says, whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, love them too much and you're done for. I ask, how the heck did this get in the Bible? Perhaps you share my concern on image of the peaceable Jesus and discord in the church and in the church family. Response to this text should start with caution. We must be careful indeed not to let the scripture be read at some, as some odd invitation to family dysfunction or disunity in the name of Christianity. We can start by acknowledge, acknowledging that this is a great example of biblical words not saying what a quick surface read might imply. It's true that an energetic proof texture could use these words to isolate, to justify isolation of a religious cult and put demands on members to split from their families. However, the scripture does not really advocate any such thing. Jesus is actually addressing the faithful who seek to live into their Christian faith under the challenging and real conditions of conflict and discouragement, and even the threat of their physical well being. All this because the gospel's calling them. In this text, Jesus is speaking directly to the 12 he has chosen to send on a mission for preaching and healing. He knows the disciples will quickly learn what it means to face opposition and struggle. Those cozy, comfortable days, those afternoons with Jesus breaking bread, feeding the 5,000, picking up baskets of leftovers will be a distant memory. A distant memory when in response to the gospel message, they are rewarded not with exception, acceptance and adulation, but with persecution. We know these challenges and even persecutions were to become part of the Christian story in every generation to follow. 
what we have here is Jesus anticipating and responding to the questions all Christians will ask. That question, what are we to do when we realize that we are not strong enough to prevail? When the world actively resists, what are we to do with the conflict that results? Well, first and foremost, take heart. Matthew assures us the church will persevere in spite of all the trials of its life and for its disciples. Even in times of fear, the gospel truth and the church will prevail. However, what about the individual disciple? For that matter, what about the family? Matthew tells us individual and family must be less concerned than the overarching importance of proclaiming God's word. We must believe that individual lives, family structure, and the whole of society will thrive when the gospel's good news is heard and embraced. Furthermore, he tells us, even if the good news of the gospel is not embraced, we need not fear for those who destroy the body because we know they cannot harm the soul. No death, not death of a person or even a sparrow, occurs outside of God's love. Jesus is asking the faithful to keep on because of our love for him and because, in the end, it will be real and everlasting life that we find through him. Well-known theologian Tom Long summarizes, in the face of conflict that disciples and Christians missionaries can expect, or even in the face of personal and family discourse, there are four things will, that will be seen. First, he says, the Holy Spirit is surely to be present and will never abandon us. Second, we will come to recognize that suffering is not wasted, but is a testimony to faith. Third, even in the midst of hardships, we know that nothing can eradicate the gospel. Nothing can destroy God's loving and watchful care over the faithful. And finally, while the family disruption will surely take place, Jesus is not against the family. Rather, there will be times when allegiance to Jesus causes a crisis of loyalty and forces a decision. Again, Long's four are, Holy Spirit is with us. Suffering is opportunity for testimony. Nothing can eradicate the gospel. Jesus is not against the family and it asks for our ultimate allegiance. Gospel shakes up values, rearranges priorities, and reorients goals of the world. Long writes, to give one's life away in the name of Christ is to give all that makes life free, holy, and good. Well, let's back up just a minute and maybe take a breath. I've been hitting you with some pretty heavy stuff here this morning. Keep in mind, this text is in the middle of Jesus' mission discourse. It's his get out the volunteers campaign like no other. We can hear that he has granted the disciples remarkable powers to heal, to exercise demons, to cleanse, and even to raise the dead. All that very positive. <clears throat> Interestingly, he, he denies them money and pay and extra clothes or even the staff and sandals. They are to undertake their mission in complete vulnerability and dependence on God. Doing mission even knowing they are like sheep in the midst of wolves and knowing they will face arrest and beating, opposition even from family members, and they are, will be hated and persecuted. You can legitimately ask, 
Why does Jesus highlight the horrors that await the disciples? And the answer comes because Jesus recognizes that they can, that those events can cause a fa can cause failure of discipleship, and it's based on fear. Naming aloud the suffering to be endured and its causes is the first step in freeing them from the tenacious grip of that fear. Jesus continues to describe <coughs> worst case scenarios, but does so with embedded statements of reassurance and repeated calls to resist fear. He says, do not fear. Do not fear. Even death is the domain, is, is, even though death is dominant, reoccurring message. However, the threat of death may be the most powerful form of creating fear. Jesus addresses this, this one particular indirectly, yet with some irony. The right to kill is one of the chief tools in the toolbox of human political power. Jesus admits that humans can and do exercise this power, but notes they have the power only to kill the body not the whole person. God alone can destroy both body and soul, the whole person. God alone, therefore, is the one we should fear. <clears throat> Jesus then reassures the disciples that God is not like human powers. God knows and cares. God knows even the hairs on our heads better than we do. The disciples are alerted that threat of violence and death are real concerns but violence and death are no longer determining forces in their lives because the one who has ultimate power over the whole being exercised with power and mercy and love is god in short god loves them so i say Thank you for your attention as I struggle with this text this morning. I think I speak for all of us when we say we are engaged in a daily struggle to understand and follow God's rule and God's way on this earth. And it's not easy. Matthew would have us understand the key here is to remember that Christ whom God sent among us did not come to usher in an era of peace, <clears throat> but rather an era of engagement towards the peaceable kingdom. In this life, we have an era of challenge where we are, where our convictions and our engagement will be tested. Decisions will be made by ourselves and by others about things that matter in this life. Decisions made while God's creation and God's people and all the earth and humanity groan for and long for restoration. We struggle with aligning those decisions with God's will. The world struggles. The struggle is not an easy burden to bear and creates divides even in families. So every day we must find ourselves praying earnestly to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, strengthen us where we are weak. Build us up where we are torn down. Prop us up on every leaning side. For we know that just as your eye is on the sparrow, your eye, your love, is always with us. Amen.